welcome Grade 12 Accounting Learners from myself, Mahesh Lal. In today's lesson, we're going to be focusing on manufacturing accounts and we're going to tackle or we're going to be looking at a question from last year's final exam. Now guys, before we look at that actual question, what I want to quickly do is recap on certain important concepts that you should be at this point familiar with in terms of manufacturing. Right, now remember, when we manufacture or when we are the accountants of a manufacturing business, this business is responsible for making the product before they can sell this product. Now, making a product obviously involves various costs. So let's just bring that down. So if we're going to be making a product, there will be a whole lot of costs that we're going to obviously incur. I just want to get my pen out. And each of these costs that the business incurs needs to be placed into a specific category. Now, the categories that you've come across already in terms of a manufacturing concern are your direct material costs. The next category is our direct labor cost. And then we have your factory overheads or your other indirect costs. Now quickly guys, I want to recap on each of these various costs that I've just mentioned. Let's start with your direct material costs. Right, what I'm going to do, guys, is let's use an example to explain our direct material costs. Let's assume that you decide to open up a business where you're going to be making biscuits from home. Now, let's go back to this concept, direct material cost. Direct materials simply refers to all the ingredients that will be used in the making of those biscuits. In other words, materials that go directly, therefore it's called direct material cost. Materials that go directly into the manufacturing or the making of this item, in this case, the biscuits. Then, the next category, people, we have our direct labor costs. Now, again, using this example that I've just given you, direct labor would refer to, let's say, for example, you want to manufacture 2,000 biscuits. You obviously need assistance. So you're going to be hiring labor. You're going to get people to work for you. It could be your friends. It could be maybe your younger brothers or sisters, whatever the case may be. That would be your direct labor, those that or the workers that directly or make the actual product itself are directly involved in the manufacturing of the product. Then the third category is our factory overheads. Factory overheads simply refers to your other costs or your indirect costs. Now, when we talk about indirect cost, if I'm going to be making biscuits, I need electricity. Um, my mom might just charge me a bit of rent for using her kitchen. So that would be a cost that I've incurred in the making or manufacturing of these biscuits. I might need someone to clean up or to help me clean up after I've made the biscuits. And remember, if you're going to get your younger brother or sister to help you, it's not going to be for free. They're going to charge you something. So whatever you're going to be paying them would be an indirect cost in the making of these biscuits. So these three categories that I've just mentioned, once we've added up our direct material cost plus our direct labor cost, plus our factory overheads or our indirect costs, we are then able to calculate our total production costs. Total production costs, how much did it actually cost me to make, for example, the 2,000 biscuits? Now, remember, guys, how are you asked 
this or how are you tested um, on this concept in your exam? There's two ways in which we can test you on this concept of total production cost. By asking you, or the first method rather, is by asking you to complete a production cost statement. Okay, so I just want to write that down. So we can ask you to complete a production cost statement. And remember guys, the word statement itself clearly indicates to you that there's a specific format that you've got to use. You cannot use your own methods of, of calculating the final amount. You've got to. If the question asks you to complete a production cost statement, you've got to stick to the format that you've learned or that you've been taught when preparing your production cost statement. The second method in which we can test this concept of total production cost is by asking you to, for example, complete certain ledger accounts. Now, your production cost statement is simply a general ledger account called work in progress. So we could ask you to maybe complete the T account or the ledger account, your work in progress. But remember, guys, if you know how to do the production cost statement, the work in progress account is simply the production cost statement, but in a ledger format. The format just changes. However, the ledger account also will have your direct material cost, your direct labor cost, and your factory overhead. So it's absolutely important that you are able to calculate these three categories of cost accounts. Okay, guys, so let's move on. So very quickly, your checklist, you need to make sure that you can perform calculations and interpret financial documents that relate to, and I've mentioned this, your direct material cost, direct labor cost, factory overheads. Obviously, these three relate to your production cost statement. And then in manufacturing, you're also going to come across certain ratios. When we talk about ratios, guys, here we're simply referring to certain calculations. For example, the break-even calculation that is absolutely important for your exams. It's always there. It's always tested in almost all the past papers. Right, guys, we're ready now to start with our question. Like I mentioned earlier on, we're going to tackle November 2011. So let's get started. Okay, the first part of the question tests certain cost concepts. So let's read through the question. You require to, for each item below, indicate the appropriate category choose your answers from the following options. So the options are your direct labor, then we've got indirect labor, direct materials is the third category given to us, and then finally indirect materials. Right guys, I know I've already explained direct labor as well as direct materials. Let's quickly explain what is indirect labor and indirect materials. Right, let's start with labor itself. Now remember, direct labor, those workers that are directly involved in the making of the product will be classified as direct labor. In other words, for a factory, it would be your factory workers. Okay, you guys are with me. Then, indirect labor, Yes, it still relates to your workers, but this would be, for example, the factory cleaner or the factory foreman, the factory security guard, people that are involved 
but not directly in the making of the product itself. So the factory foreman, he's responsible for walking around, checking that the factory workers are busy um, in the production process itself. The factory security guard, obviously he's responsible for the overall security of the factory premises itself. He has nothing to do with the making or the manufacturing of the products. So these would be classified as our indirect labor. Then we've got direct material and indirect materials. I've already explained direct materials, those items or those ingredients, if it was a food item that goes directly into the making of the product itself. Indirect material, All right guys, these are items or materials that are used, um, for example, when you have to clean up. So earlier on, I gave you an example where you are making biscuits, and let's assume you're doing this at home, you're making biscuits. Obviously, afterwards, you need to clean up. You're going to need certain cleaning agents, and these items are classified as your indirect materials. Right, let's now look at the question itself. The first question, cost of the raw materials used in the production process. So it's raw materials used in the actual production process. Okay, guys, materials, is it direct or is it indirect? Actually used in the production process, it's got to be direct. So your answer for two marks is your direct materials. Okay, easy, absolutely straightforward and simple. The next question or the next category given to us, the salary of the factory foreman. Aha, I mentioned this earlier. Factory foreman, yes, he is a worker, but does he make the actual product itself? No, so it cannot be direct labor. This has to be your indirect labor. Okay, and again, another two marks for placing it in the correct category. Then, the third um, item given to us, the cleaning materials used in the factory. Cleaning materials, I've just explained this. This has to be our indirect materials. Guys, we're going to take a quick ad break. And when you come back, we're going to then continue with this question. See you in a bit. Welcome back, guys. If you've just joined us, it's not too late because we're still looking at um, a question on manufacturing and we're now ready to move on to the second question, which is your production cost statement. All right, so let's read this question. We've got a business given to us called Sleepwell Manufacturers. You are required to complete the production cost statement for the year ended 30th September 2011. Remember guys, year end is absolutely important because from that bit of information, you can work out which is the beginning of the financial year and obviously the end of the financial year. Some of the details have been entered for you. You have to complete the missing details and figures. And this question is for 10 marks. All right, let's go through our information. The information below was extracted from the financial records of Sleepwell Manufacturers on the 30th of September 2011, the end of the financial year. Right, guys, now remember, what does this question want you to do? It wants you to prepare the production cost statement. And in the beginning or in my introduction, I explained that the production cost statement is made up of your direct material cost plus direct labor cost and then we have our other costs or our factory overheads. So in the actual production cost statement, we obviously need to enter the information 
um, or we need to enter these three categories of costs. This must go in our production cost statement. Something else that I mentioned earlier on was your work in progress. Remember the T account work in progress? So we're going to come across balances probably of work in progress at the beginning of the year as well as balances at the end of the year. Let's read on. So we are given our finished goods on the 1st of October 2010. Remember people, finished goods does not go in the production cost statement. So for this particular question, I don't think I need finished goods. Then I've got work in progress on the 1st of October 2010. I just mentioned work in progress. This is 1st October 2010 would be beginning of the year. So somewhere in my production cost statement, I am going to need this bit of information. Then I've got administration cost, which again has absolutely nothing to do with production. Direct or raw material costs. There's my direct material cost. And again, I need this bit of information for that production cost statement. The next item, also something that I need, direct labor cost. And then I've got my factory overhead cost. So all three costs are given to me. I don't have to do any calculations. The next bit of information, selling and distribution costs, again, guys, has absolutely nothing to do with the actual manufacturing process itself. So this will not go in my production cost statement. The next item, cost of production of finished goods. Now, remember, guys, this is important. I need this bit of information. Then I've been given sales, cost of sales. Both of these items do not go in the production cost statement. Then I've got finished goods on the 30th of September 2011. Again, finished goods, people. I don't use this for my production cost statement. And then finally, I've got work in progress 30th September 2011. This is at the end of the financial year. And remember, guys, end of the financial year, yes, I'm going to use this bit of information, but they haven't given me the amount. So I'm going to have to calculate that amount. Right, guys, let's now go to that production cost statement. Let's look at what information has been filled in for us already. Okay, production cost statement for the year ended 30th September 2011. They are giving me my direct material cost, which is already filled in for me. Then I've got work in progress stock on the 1st of October 2010, which is also filled in for me. And then cost of production of finished goods, the third item, which I don't have to worry about. It's already there for me. It's filled in for me. Right, guys, let's now start. Let's complete this production cost statement. Direct labor cost. I have, I, there's absolutely no calculation. So all I'm going to do now is go back to my information, my direct labor cost. I came across it. There we go. Direct labor cost given to me 640,500. Okay, so there's the amount, and all I'm doing is taking it through to that production cost statement. So let's go to the production cost statement. We're taking through the amount of 640,000. 500. Simple, just filling in the amount. Absolutely no calculation. The next item, my prime or my direct cost. Now, guys, you came across this when you were doing manufacturing in class. Prime cost simply refers to your direct material cost plus your direct labor cost is going to give you your prime cost. Prime, another word for prime cost would be direct cost. What are the costs involved in making this actual product itself, the direct cost itself? So let's get those calculators out. All right, so all we're doing, guys, is we're going to add up 
these two amounts, so 1,250,000 is my direct material cost plus my direct labor cost 640,500 to give me a prime cost 1,890,500. So let's fill that in. 1 million, let's get those pens out, 1 million 890,500. Okay, simple, easy stuff, guys. Let's move on. So we've already done our direct material costs. We've already entered our direct labor costs. Now we've got to go through through to the third cost, which is our factory overhead cost. So our factory overhead cost has already been calculated for us. So let's go back to our information. Our factory overhead cost is an amount of 728,000. Okay, absolutely easy, guys. All the calculation is done for you. It's just a matter of extracting the figures and slotting it into that production cost statement. So let's fill in this amount. My factory overheads, an amount of 728,000. Right, I now obviously have the three costs that I need in order to calculate what is my total production cost. So all we're doing now is we're gonna add on our factory overhead cost to our prime cost to get that total cost of production. So again, let's get our calculators out. So we've already got our prime costs and we're now simply adding on 728,000. Okay, there we go. We've got an amount of 2,618,500. So let's fill that in. I'm just going to quickly change the color of my pen there. It's an amount of 2,618,500. Okay, let's just double check. There we go. It's correct. Right, guys? Almost at the end of this production cost statement, once I calculate the total cost of production, all I've got to do or all that's left for me to do is ask myself, was there any work in progress at the beginning of the year? Now, if we read on, we've got work in progress stock on the 1st of October 2010. Remember, work in progress means that the product is not fully completed as yet. So at the beginning of the year, there was a production or a work in process stock for 45,000. All we're doing, guys, is we're going to add, let's get our pens out, we are going to add on this 45,000 to our total cost of production. So let's do that. Okay, so I've got my total cost of production, and all I'm doing is adding on 45,000. Okay, guys, it can't get easier than this. The amount that I've now got is 2,663,500. So let's fill that in. Okay, so we're filling in that amount of 2,663,500. Okay, all right, let's look at the last part of our production cost statement. The cost of production of finished goods is already filled in for us. So what is missing, guys? Come, they've given you the entire format, but something is missing. Correct, work in progress at the end of the year was missing. Our work in process stock at the end of the financial year, or you can actually fill in the dates. I'm not going to do that. And we now need to work out what is that amount. In production, we've got an amount of 2,663,500. So remember, let's just quickly get another color pen. Okay, so this amount here is still in production. And then we've got 
the cost of production of finished goods, finished meaning that it has been completed. So the products that have been completed, 2,625,000. So these items have already been completed. In other words, you're ready now to sell these items. So obviously, whatever you started, you haven't completed all of the products itself. So the difference between these two amounts would be our work in process stock, stock that still needs to be completed. So let's get those calculators out and let's calculate that work in progress. So all I'm doing is subtracting my completed goods, 2,625,000. Okay, and the stock that still needs to be completed, 38,500. Okay, so let's fill that in. Remember, this must be in brackets, guys, 38,000. 500. Right, absolutely simple. I know I've said this before, but remember, guys, if, if you're going to get, not if, you're definitely going to get a question um, on manufacturing in your final exam. Production cost statement has been there for the last four, five odd years. It's something that I am sure will be in this year's exam. When you walk into that room, guys, you've got to know your production cost statement. Now, what we're going to do is let's take a quick ad break. Maybe you want to quickly pop into the kitchen and get something to drink or something to eat. And when you guys come back, we're going to tackle question three on that break-even calculation. See you guys in a bit. Welcome back, guys. Ready for question three? I know I am, so let's get started. This question relates to pies galore. The business produced 15,500 pies. Okay, I'm just going to underline that 15,500 pies for the year ended 30th June 2011. So obviously a different um, business is given to us in comparison to question two. We've now got a new business called Pies Galore. They obviously manufacture pies and their financial year ends on the 30th of June, 2011. I'm just gonna write down end of the financial year. And as we know, beginning of the financial year will obviously be 1st July, 2010. This would be the beginning of that financial year. You required, let's go through the questions, 3.1, calculate the direct material cost per unit, so direct material cost per unit for 2011 for three marks, then calculate the break-even point for the year ended 30 June 2011, so that break-even calculation appears in every exam, this exam for five marks. And then 3.3, should the business be satisfied with the number of units that they are currently producing? Briefly explain for three marks. So immediately, guys, 3.3, when we're answering 3.3, we've got to take into account 3.2 the answer that we're going to get when we're going to calculate that break-even point. Let's read on. 3.4, the direct material cost per unit for 2010 amounted to 3 rand 80. The owner, and her name is Kathy, feels that in order to make more profit, she will have to cut her costs or increase her selling price. She considers the option to cut her costs by using fewer ingredients in the filling, but keeps the selling price the same. And then we are asked, should she carry on with her plan? Give one valid reason for your decision. So a question where we've got to think a bit, we've got to probably um, use our knowledge and business ethics when we're answering this question. Right, let's move on. Let's now go and look at the information on the question itself. The following information was extracted from the books. So they're giving us sales 
the total sales is given to us and then we've got per unit now remember guys per unit obviously refers to one item in this case it is one pie so the sales or the selling price of one pie is 14 rand 50 cents okay I'm just going to write down SP selling price then we've got total variable costs which is given to us at a total of 131,750 and per unit the variable cost per unit for one pie is 8 rand 50 then we've got total fixed cost 89,900 per unit again given to us and then we've got direct material cost the total is given to us 79,050 rand and per unit this amount here is not given to us right guys quickly before we answer the questions itself I just want to recap on the difference between total variable costs and total fixed costs now total variable cost this refers to costs that vary with the increase or decrease in production so for example in this case when you are making the pies the more pies you manufacture your total variable cost will then increase because items like direct material costs direct labor costs are directly related to the making of the pie itself your variable cost for these cost items obviously increases it varies it changes with the number of the product that you actually manufacturing your total fixed costs on the other hand fixed meaning constant these are costs that remain constant regardless of whether you make one pie or whether you make a hundred pies an example would be the rent that you have to pay for the factory regardless of whether like I said you're making one pie or a hundred pies you still at the end of the month you need to pay that rent so therefore it's regarded as a fixed cost variable cost it varies with the um, number of units that you manufacture fixed costs remain constant they remain the same right we've read through our information now let's go straight to the questions itself and let's now complete the first question 3.1 calculate the direct material cost per unit for 2011 let's get the pens out direct material cost per unit 2011 now remember guys per unit means what is the direct materials that are used to make one pie so in terms of our calculation we're going to need our total direct material cost we then going to divide this by the number of units that have been produced or manufactured okay let's now complete this direct material cost let's go back to our info so we've got the table there at the bottom our direct material cost is 79,050 so that's obviously my direct material cost so let's now take that through okay direct material cost and amount of let's fill that in send the page there a bit an amount of 79,050 we now need to divide this by the number of units or the number of pies that were manufactured I think it's 15,500 but let's just go back and um, make sure so the business produced 15,500 pies so that's the number of units we've produced so let's take that through okay so it's an amount of 15,500 all right let's get the calculator out okay let's clear that so we've got direct material costs 79,050 and we are dividing this by the number of pies that were made or manufactured okay and we are getting an amount of 5,1 or 5 rand 10 cents so let's now fill this in 5 rand 10 cents is our 
direct material cost per unit. In other words, for one pie itself. Right, easy stuff, guys. Let's move on to the next question. The next question, calculate the break-even point for the year ended 30th June 2011. Right, guys, break-even point. I know you know how to do this, but let's quickly recap. Break even at this point, if the business sells all the products that they've actually made itself, at the point of break even, remember, there is no profit, nor is there a loss. Hence the reason for calling it break even. Now, how do we calculate this break even point itself? We, there are two steps in which or two steps rather that we use when calculating break even. And it's absolutely important, guys, that you show these two steps. Because remember, if I get my final amount incorrect, there's obviously part marks that I can earn because of my calculations. So let's now look at this calculation itself. The first step when calculating break even point is to be able to calculate what we call contribution. Okay, now how do we get contribution? Contribution, guys, is simply taking your selling price per unit and we are subtracting your variable costs per unit. Okay, contribution, selling price per unit minus variable costs per unit. And again, in this question, they've, they've actually given us the information. We don't have to now calculate what is the selling price or what is that variable cost per unit. The info has already been given to us. So let's go back to the information. Okay, there we go. So we need selling price per unit. Okay, and there's my selling price per unit, 14 rand 50 cents, and we need variable cost per unit. Variable cost per unit, 8 rand 50 cents. Okay, let's take this through. Okay, so my selling price per unit was an amount of, okay, 14 rand and 50 cents and all I'm doing is subtracting that variable cost per unit which was an amount of 8 rand 50 cents again taking this information directly from the question itself okay let's get those calculators out just move this a bit so we can see okay so 14 rand and 50 cents minus 8 rand and 50 cents. I know, guys, we don't need a calculator for this, but your break even, or oh, sorry, not break even, but contribution rather is six rand. So let's now fill that in. Contribution and amount of, there we go, six rand. Right, that is step one. Calculate C, C for contribution. We are going to take our total fixed cost and we're going to then divide this by our contribution. So I'm going to just write that down. We're going to take our fixed cost. And here, remember people, it's our total fixed cost. And we're going to then divide this by C, C for contribution. So again, Let's now go back to our information because the total fixed cost has already been given to you. There's no calculation in order for you to get the total fixed cost. So let's go back. Okay, your total fixed cost, guys, was total fixed cost. There we go, 89,900. So let's now take that amount through. Okay, it was an amount of, get the pen out there. Extend the page a bit, 89,900. 
We're then going to divide this amount by C, what we've just calculated, the contribution. And remember, we had an amount of 6 Rand, which was our contribution. So let's now work out what is that break-even point. In other words, how many pies should be manufactured in order for this business to break even? The point where there's no profit, nor is there a loss. So let's get our calculator out again. Okay, and again, I'm just going to move that quickly. So we've got our total fixed cost, 89,900. We're dividing this by six to get our break-even point, 14,983. And I'm going to round this off, guys, because you can't make 0.3 pies. It has to be a whole number. So 14,983. Let's just fill that in. 14,983. Okay, so this is our break-even point. These are the number of pies that needs to be manufactured in order for the business to break even. Break even, guys, I know I've said this already, but remember, it's that point where there's no profit, nor is there a loss. All right, let's move on now to our next question, which actually relates to this question that we've just completed. Should the business be satisfied with the number of units that they are currently producing? And they want you to briefly explain. Now, guys, very, very important. They are obviously asking you, should the business be satisfied? So you need to start with yes, they should be satisfied, or no, they should not be satisfied. This is absolutely important, guys, because from the three marks, there's one mark given for either stating yes or stating no. And thereafter, you obviously need to explain yourself for the rest of the marks. In this case, two marks. So remember, exam technique, read the question carefully and answer the question according to what is being asked. Should they be satisfied? Yes or no. Right, now, before we make that conclusion, whether our answer is going to be yes or no, I'm going to quickly do or look at two figures that's going to help me determine whether they should be satisfied or whether they should not be satisfied. At the moment, this business is producing 15,500 pies. And we just calculated, let's just go back, the break-even point is 14,983 pies. So let's record that. And I'm going to use a different color for this. So at the moment, or the break-even point rather, is an amount of 14,983. Now remember, what does break-even tell you at this point? No profit, no loss. Anything above break-even means that the business, let's just put this, anything above break-even means that the business will be making a profit. Anything that is lower than break-even means that the business will be making a loss. In other words, they're not breaking even. They're not covering their total fixed costs as such. So if we now inspect the figures that's given to us, at the moment, the business is producing 15,500 pies. Break even is 14,983. So obviously, guys, can you see the business is producing a lot more, not a lot, but they're obviously producing more in terms of break even. It's higher than break even point. So the business obviously will make a profit. Okay, you guys with me? So our answer would be yes, they should be satisfied. And the reason that we should state or the reason would be they are producing they are producing, and let's just quickly work out what the difference is, guys. So if I had to work out the difference, 15,500 minus 14,983. So they're producing 517 
more pies in terms of break even itself. So they are producing, let's just write this down. Okay, 517 units more than what is required to break even. Okay, guys, I'm abbreviating, but remember you're not allowed to in the exam. You've got to write this in full. Okay, you guys with me? Right, let's now move on to the next question. 3.4. The direct material cost per unit for 2010 amounted to 3 Rand 80. Okay, so if we quickly, I'm going to just jot this down. So 2010, the direct material cost is 3 Rand 80. And remember, guys, in the very first question, we were required to calculate what is that direct material cost for 2011. So I just want to quickly go back to that information and extract the answer that we got. Okay, we got an answer of 5 Rand 10. Let's just put that down. Okay, so we had an amount of, yeah, let's just use a different color pen. So we had an amount of 5 Rand 10. So let's just read this one more time. The direct material cost per unit for 2010 amounted to 3 Rand 80. The owner, or Kathy, feels that in order to make more profit, she will have to cut her costs or increase her selling price. Okay, so if we inspect this, it's obviously costing her much more in terms of direct materials to make one pie. 2010, the ingredients that went into the making of the pie costed her 3 Rand 80 cents. 2011, it's gone up to 5 Rand 10 cents. So clearly, there has been an increase in costs, and the options that she's faced with is she either has to cut her costs or she has to increase her selling price. She considers the option to cut her costs by using fewer ingredients in the filling, but keeping the selling price the same. Right, what do we mean by this, guys? Let's assume that it is a vegetable pie. Now, the ingredients that goes into the making of a veg pie, veg guys, because I'm vegetarian, so let's talk about veg pies. In a veg pie, obviously a whole lot of vegetables. So you've got your mushrooms, you've got your peas, you've got your carrots, all the various veggies that goes into the making of the pie. Now, if she's going to cut down on her ingredients, she's going to probably put less mushrooms or she's going to put less carrots. And remember, by her doing this, it compromises on the taste of that pie itself, the quality of that pie. Now, if I am used to buying a pie, let's say, every Saturdays or, or whatever the case may be, I'm going to know that, aha, uh -huh, there's something wrong here. This pie just doesn't taste the same anymore. So, if she's going to cut down on her ingredients or she's going to try and cut her costs, Obviously, it's going to compromise on the quality of that product itself. Right, let's read the question. So you've got, should she carry on with her plan? Give one valid reason for your decision. And what's her plan, people? To put fewer ingredients in the filling of the pie itself. Right, guys, I've already, let's just take that away. Let's extend the page there. I've already answered the question. Um, should she carry on with her plan? What do you guys think? No, obviously, obviously, people, she should not carry on with this plan. So immediately, by you saying no, remember, you are answering the question. Should she carry on with her plan? No. The reason um, she's going to be misleading her customers Okay, because remember, the, the, her customers are still going to pay that same selling price. It's still going to cost them, uh, what was it, guys? I think it was 14 Rand and um, 
some sense. It's still going to cost them that amount, but the quality is going to be inferior. It's not going to be the same. So one reason she's misleading her customers. The second reason, guys, it is unethical business practice to do this. You, you should not do this in terms of your business itself. So it is unethical. All right, something else that you could write down as your answer, we've spoken about this already, um, the quality of the product, okay, quality will be compromised, okay, you guys must write this out in full, and remember, by the quality being compromised, what's going to happen? I'm not going to want to buy that pie anymore, so by her cutting down costs, in essence, what's going to happen is that she's going to end up losing customers. Okay, so she's going to be losing customers. Remember, guys, the question wants you to just give one valid reason for your decision or for your answer. I've given four, but in the exam, you reading the question very carefully. You cannot waste time, and therefore, you just give one valid reason. Right, guys, it's time for me to say goodbye, but from myself, Mahesh Lal, good luck for your final exams. God bless you, and yeah, just go out there and do your absolute best in accounting. Bye-bye.